that much is a ritual version of the same salvation by works, which is not the gospel. So we reject baptismal regeneration. We are back to the question, what does baptism do? What is the significance of baptism? Well, let's go to the New Testament presentation. And the first thing is what the New Testament uses as the type of baptism in the Old Testament. What in the Old Testament typified baptism? There are two that the New Testament uses for that. The first is in 1 Peter. <coughs> Somebody please read 1 Peter 3, 18 to 21. But Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God who will keep the death in the flesh, and make a man in the spirit, in which he went to proclaim the spirits in prison, because they probably did not obey when God God's vision is greater than the days of Noah, while the dark was being prepared, to which a few, the same persons, were brought safely to the water. But this thing which corresponds to this now saves it, as a removal of dirt from the body, but does not appear to us by a good conscience to the resurrection of Jesus. So here the antitype that is being used <coughs> is that of the flood. And the resulting salvation of Noah and his household. Now, it is not saying that baptism itself saves. Immediately after Peter said that in corresponding to the flood, baptism saves you immediately. He qualifies it by saying, not the, renew, that, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. The saving act is in the resurrection of Christ. So it's not baptism. But baptism is a sign of that salvation. Or as again, Peter says, the answer of a good conscience toward God, explains Wayne Grudem. We could paraphrase Peter's statement by saying, baptism now saves you, not the outward physical ceremony of baptism, but the inward spiritual reality which baptism represents. In this way, Peter guards against any view of baptism that would attribute automatic saving power to the physical ceremony itself. So here is one... Old Testament type that the New Testament uses for baptism. Another is the Exodus event. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now we know the significance of the Exodus in the Old, Test Old Testament. It was the paradigm of redemption. In the, Old Testament, in the Old Testament, when they thought of redemption event, the paradigm was the Exodus. And in fact, when the latter prophets anticipated the redemptive act of God, they, ex they couched it in the language of the Exodus. So the Exodus was the redemptive act. Now, in what way is this a, a type of baptism? Well, I think the proper understanding is in its orient orientation to the central figure of that event, Moses. They were baptized into Moses. Moses was the mediator chosen by God in the Old Testament. And uh, through him, he redeemed his people and their crossing of the Red Sea came to be seen by Paul as a type. Of baptism being identified with as the Israelites were identified with Moses in the crossing of the Red Sea in baptism we are identified with the Lord Jesus Christ so those are the types of the Old Testament now direct teachings what does the New Testament teach is the significance of baptism well let's look at some key texts one we already looked at is the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19. Make disciples, baptizing them. Here, the baptizing identifies the disciples among people groups. So make disciples of all nations. Of those nations, some will become disciples. How do you distinguish those who are made disciples out of a nation? They are the baptized ones. You baptize them. So in other words, they are first made into disciples, then baptize them. 
So out of a nation, some will become disciples. And how do you identify those disciples? Baptizing them. So baptizing here is understood as identifying the disciples out of a nation. There is here a certain public character of that baptism, a distinguishing act, what separates the people who are disciples out of a nation is that they are baptized. The baptizing also anticipates the church duty of teaching and observing Christ's commandments. Those who are baptized, you teach to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you. So in other words, after being consecrated from out of a nation they are identified as disciples now these disciples baptized are the ones to be taught and expected to observe the commandments of Christ then in the first act of baptism by the church after the Christ event on Pentecost those who gladly received the word were baptized 3,000 souls were added to them. So, again, two points of significance here. Who were baptized? Those who received the word. What happened to those baptized? They were added to the church. So, it identifies those who are to receive baptism, and it tells us what happens to them who receive baptism. Those who received the word were baptized. Those baptized were added to the church. And then Galatians 3.27, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And again, as many of you, connects to the previous verse 26, You are all sons of God through faith. And as many of you who are sons of God through faith, they are the ones baptized. And when, when baptized, what happens? You have put on Christ. And this is to say that they are identified with Christ in a visible or declarative way. You are declaring to the world who you are. The context here is that of the theater. You identify the character of the actors by their costume, by what they wear. And now Paul is saying, by being baptized, you put on, you wear the costume of Christ so that in the theater of the world, you are identified as to your character. You are playing the role of Christ. <clears throat> then Romans 6 verse 3. This is answering the false logic. If grace abounds, where sin abounds, let us sin all the more that grace may abound all the more. And of course, Paul, in his typical answer, says, by no means, a gonite. This is Paul's answer to the logic of looseness in life on account of grace. And what Paul is saying by his appeal to baptism is that it is incompatible with the identification of the believer with Christ signified in baptism. As Sproul comments, he says that if we were baptized, then whatever else baptism signified for us, one of the crucial elements of the symbolism of baptism is that it marks our identification with the death of Jesus. Paul is not saying that the very act of baptism automatically gives us all the benefits of Christ's atonement. Paul tells us to, to go back to the beginning of our Christian lives, to go back to the marks of our baptism, and to remind ourselves what baptism signifies. My baptism signifies my identification with Jesus' death on the cross. And the implication is, how dare you say you live on in sin so that grace may abound? You have taken care of that issue when you were baptized. That from then on, you will live in the newness of life. So here is, again, a significance of baptism that has to do with one's declared pledge of living for Christ. Ephesians 4, 4 and 5, there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. So in the subject of the unity of the church, baptism is part of the bond of unity. All members 
are therefore assumed to have been similarly baptized. Meaning, no one can be considered a member who is not baptized. So there is no associate of unbaptized membership. All members are baptized as part of the bond of unity of the church. And being baptized implies being one with the faith identity of the church. One Lord, one faith, and the faith here is not faith of believing. It is the faith that is believed. What you believe. In other words, the cluster of truths that identifies the confession of the church. So to be baptized is to adopt the faith of the church, the belief of the church. <clears throat> and then finally, Colossians 2 verse 12. We will deal with this more when we come to the Peter Baptist argument of the analogy of baptism and circumcision. But for now, let us just consider what baptism does according to this text. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith. So there is an analogy with Old Testament circumcision to be considered later. But what it tells us is that baptism identifies with the death of Christ and is a sign of our completeness in Him. So again, the idea of identification. What actually saves are those events of death and resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. What baptism does is that we are identified with the gospel events. So in summary, baptism is the initiating and covenanting ordinance of confessed discipleship. So the confession is already there. Discipleship is already there. What baptism does is by initiating a public declaration and by covenanting with the church. So all disciples of Christ are assumed to be baptized. The idea of choosing not to be baptized is not in the New Testament. The idea of an unbaptized Christian is a monstrosity that the New Testament does not know about. All disciples of Christ are assumed to be baptized and the efficacy of baptism is oriented to the, to the reality of faith in the gospel. All these passages we read assume that the one being baptized is a disciple Son of God through faith in Christ having been identified with his death and resurrection all these passages assume that the one baptized is a believer more of that when we come to subject baptism identifies the disciple with Christ and his saving death and resurrection and baptism incorporates the baptized into the church and unites with its faith so there is in the act of baptism, an act of being added to the church. And that is clear in Acts chapter 2. And we will make that clear when we come to the issue of uh, entry into the church through the act of baptism. Any questions?